Tonight we're going to talk about agreeing with the Father in his vision for, for your brothers and sisters' lives. Now, that's a long title, so we shortened the title, but that's where we're going. Let's go look at Ephesians 4. I think it's going to make sense. You see, every time you open your mouth, you're either agreeing with the vision of God for your life or disagreeing. You're either agreeing, yes, God's on my side and counting, or, okay? But we can also do the same for our brothers and sisters. Ephesians 4, verse 11. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. So let's look at those two verses. The chief aim of the Bible ministry gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, the chief aim is to equip the saints. But what's the main goal of the saints? Same verse, verse 12. The goal of the saints is to build up the body of Christ. Okay, let's go back and read it again. This is, okay, you can say, well, who are the, the prophets, pastors? Al Fury is more, he's coming the beginning of November. He's an evangelist, but he also is a prophetic evangelist. He has the, the gift of a prophet on. You can see that. I mean, he knows things about people supernaturally. So he's not just an evangelist. Some people have signs and wonders of healing, but they're not really prophetic. They're just, they're evangelists with Whenever you see a true evangelist, you're going to see the gifts of the Spirit to convince the lost. Okay? So let's back up. An apostle is somebody that is sent to a place that has never had a mighty work and God uses them. Dallas Clemens, that many of you don't know or remember, but he was part of this, you know, part of the board here. He would go to a place and start a church and it's still there today. Like he was an apostle. A sent one is what it means. The prophet, it doesn't mean that they prophesy into your life to tell you what to do now, but they have a prophetic insight into lives to give you a word from God, okay? The evangelist wins souls by the gifts of the Spirit. The pastor you know, and a teacher, there is, you see, I'm a pastor teacher. That's my two gifts, okay? And I teach you. The gift of a teacher shouldn't be boring. Now, your teaching can be boring, but if it's a really a gift to teach, it shall be boring because it's interesting, okay? Yeah. Now, what, am, what are the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher to do? It says he gave those five ministry gifts, next verse, to equip the saints. Now, what are the saints to do? They're to do the work of service to build up the body of Christ. So the end result and the end uh, goal of every church is to build up the body. Keep reading. This may not be exciting, but it's good. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. You say, what's the ultimate goal of the Holy Spirit in every believer's life and every group of believers' life is maturity? Okay, well, that's not fun. Well, I know. It was more fun when you were a little kid and didn't have to pay bills. But, but guess what? Emotional maturity is a good thing. Emotional maturity means that you're... Paul doesn't get walked, knocked out of the water every time one little thing, okay? Maturity is the goal of the Holy Spirit. And that means that any area of immaturity we're supposed to tackle. Okay, hallelujah. I'm going to be excited. Look at verse 14. As a result, we are no longer to be children. Saying dumb stuff. And you say, what is this? Okay, I'm going to tell you what this lesson is about. Do you remember how we talked on Sunday? That the voice of the Lord... Is, it's not Milton's, the only thing, Mr. Rogers. Welcome to the neighborhood. I'm glad to get in the kingdom. No, no. The voice of the Lord, it says in Psalm 29, verse 4, is powerful and majestic. Now, right now, we are less aware of the spiritual world than we will someday. We see through a glass dimly. We see through a veil. Yeah. We hear as if the trumpet were muted. If the trumpet sounds today, it's very muted. But God's voice is powerful and majestic. And what we didn't finish in the sermon, because there's so much going on, is that when you put the Word of God inside you, even if it doesn't sound like a roaring lion, it is one. And when it starts reverberating off the walls of your spirit long enough, it will come out your mouth, and it will come out just as if God said it. Yeah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Now, my thing tonight is that I want you to see not only do you have an obligation to speak truth and faith over your life, but you have an obligation to speak truth and faith over every single member in this body. And everyone that, you know, it's easy over our own kids usually. Yeah. At least we're a little more aware of it. But we're supposed to speak faith and truth over our own children. I'm supposed to speak faith and truth over you. Yeah. Okay. Hallelujah. 
Look at verse 14. As a result, we're no longer to be children. Tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. We're not supposed to be suckers for stupid um, tricks of the devil. Yeah. You know, real. Okay. Verse 15. How do you avoid that? But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So Christ is the head of the body. We're part of the body. We're supposed to grow up and look just like our older brother. Yeah. That's what it says. Is the Lord Jesus our older brother? Yes. yes. But speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up into all aspects into him who, him who is the head, even Christ. Now, if you want to grow up looking just like your older brother, what do you do? You speak the truth in love. Exactly what is the truth? You know, may know, but John 17, 17, Jesus was praying the night before he went to the cross for his disciples, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So if you're going to speak the truth in love, you better be speaking what the word says. Now look at the same things in Psalm 119. This is the same thing in verse 160. The sum of your word is truth. This is truth. Now somebody might get diagnosed with a terrible disease, but it's still the truth that by the stripes of Jesus they were healed. Amen. And you say, well, how can you say that that's truth? This is something that will never change. When you get to heaven, all the truth will be right there. You will not be sick. Now, if you say, I don't know how to take truth from that realm and apply it to this realm, if you're saved, you already have. Yeah. If the only information we have about your life is this realm, you're a sinner on the way to hell. Right. Sorry. Maybe not. Maybe a couple of us. I was, a, okay. <laughs> I can prove to you that you're not going to heaven if this is the only realm that we have and God is perfect. But we took information from a higher realm that says the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. He died for us. The Father raised him from the dead. He seated him in the right hand. He paid the full and complete part, um, price of our redemption. And we took that truth and applied it to our nature. We got born again. Yeah. You can take the same truth that said Jesus himself carried away your diseases and put it on your body and get healed. Yes. It's a higher truth. So what it says in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, with Part of the truth is you need to tell the truth on your taxes and tell truth about not natural things, but you also need to take that higher truth of the Word of God and apply it to your kids. Even when it doesn't look like they're doing right. Speaking the truth in love, we grow up. So, my question tonight, how many of you have ever spoken the truth in love over yourself? I am strong in the Lord and the strength of His mind. I can do all. Okay, I'm, I'm in perfect agreement with that. For one thing, you're a greater blessing to the body of Christ when you're speaking the truth in love. You know, you're a blessing. Okay. But I, once in a while, I hear somebody say something about somebody in the church. And we have a marvelous church. So much love. There's some things I would never, ever say. I would never say that person struggles with depression. Come on. You say, why? Because the, they have been delivered. There's a way out for them. I'm going to either, listen. Every time there's a problem, you either reaffirm what the devil's doing or you hold the truth of the word of God. Hallelujah. The greatest kind, let me give you, are you mad that we're talking about real stuff here? We're talking about real stuff. This is where we live. Over the course of the time I've had to pastor the church, three different people have come up to me and very quietly said, I suffer from terrible panic attacks. And graciously, I mean, that's, I understand that. I've been there, done that, didn't want to see anybody. I know about panic attacks. But I also know you're wrestling with a demon. You're, you are doing hand-to-hand -hand combat, face-to-face -face combat with the demon. See, that's scary. Not if you know who Jesus is. Not if you're under the blood. Not if you know your authority. And in all three of those cases, I said, you'll never have to have another one. This is a real blessing to me to be able to do this. And I said, there's a demon of fear, and we're going to call it down. And we found it, and we said, never again. One of those people never came back to church. And she was just new and whatever. And so I assumed that they probably went on and she got mad at me or something. I ran into her in her store over two years later. She said, you know, I'm sorry I haven't been attending church, but I want you to know I never had another panic attack. The other two people never had another panic attack. Yeah. And, and he said, oh, you think you're something? No, it's just that if you know who you are in Christ, you can stop really easy stuff. That's low-level stuff. It's easy to stop. The greatest kindness you will ever show a brother or sister who suffers, and I'm using this example, from a panic attack, is not to reaffirm 
the panther track and say, well, you know, they just can't go out in public. And they, no, no, forget it. Don't ever say it. Yeah. If you say it, you're affirming what Satan's doing. Come on. If you want to be free yourself, you don't say it. You say never again. And on behalf of your brother or sister, you say they are free in the name of Jesus. I, you say, I believe that they are being set free from all fear. I believe Sister Matilda can go anywhere she wants to in any place the Lord sends her, okay? I couldn't think of any names we didn't have in the church. So I just, let's... <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm telling you today that God's word is alive and it roars his will. You may not hear the roar, but there's a roar in the world of God. There is, he's a lamb, but he's also a lion in the tribe of Judah. And if you will take his word and stand on it, you can do people immense um, good. You have an obligation to use your faith and authority, both to set yourself free from all the binds and your brothers and sisters free. I want to tell you that whenever the Lord is getting ready to deliver somebody from something, he sends someone. Hallelujah. Perfect love casts out fear. So you say, I just surround them with my love, and I believe if somebody is struggling with a sin, I'll never tell you. Amen. But I use my faith, and if it comes to me, like one time, somebody went back to drinking, they've been soft for a long time. Nobody's here tonight, so I'm trying to figure out what you'll never figure it out. <laughs> and I never told a person, but every time I think of it, I see foul demon. You foul devil. When somebody is wrestling with a horrible temptation, I'm telling you right now, you're wrestling with a demonic spirit. Yeah. And you say, what do you do? Well, first of all, get saved and get filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit will take away your fear of the devil. And second of all, get in the Word of God and understand what the blood of Jesus has done for you. Amen. Oh, they're free today. It got over in six weeks and they've never gone back in five years. But you see, it's my responsibility as your pastor to see you as God sees you. Yeah. It's my responsibility to see you triumphant and winning and living out every day. To see you fulfilling your hope. And I'm not saying you aren't already doing that for people. If you are, obviously, but just this is what God's called us to do. Because people are walking in with broken lives and hurting. And I see you ministering wholeness. I'm just affirming what you're doing. When, when Ephesians 4.15 says, speak the truth in love, it means only agree with the Bible. If somebody's diagnosed with leukemia, don't go around telling the whole world they have leukemia. Just say, you know, they're fighting a the battle in their body, but the, the word of the living God says that by Jesus' stripes, they were healed. And you say, what difference does it make? You are a human being on planet Earth with, with your authority restored. And you say, oh, you help everybody get rid of everything? No, I can't. No, listen, part of it is up to them. Yeah. Part of it is up to them, and I don't always help, but I'm telling you what, we're batting pretty high up here. We're only up around 950, I would say. Seriously, if we send 20 prayer requests, I'll, I'll guarantee you 19 of them will get answered. And why is that? Because we're agreeing with one another. If someone in the church were diagnosed with a mental condition, I would never repeat it. And you say, is it disgraceful? No, it's not a matter of shame. It's a matter of affirming what the devil's doing. Yeah. Now listen. I would just say the Lord will keep them in perfect peace as their mind is stayed on him. I thank God he is restoring their soul. Okay. You see, years and years ago, I was in awful depression. And if I started to slip back into that depression, then I won't. I guess I'd keep saying I won't. But if I did, I would hope you wouldn't go around saying, oh, pastor's back in depression. She's going to end up in the mental institution. I hope you wouldn't, you would say, oh, she knows better than this. This devil is so under her feet. The blood, devil, the blood is against you. And you get in with that person that's at war and you help them get sin off their life. You help them. Yeah. And you say, why are you so fiery about it? Because I've seen help work. Yes. Hallelujah. I want to give you some high mileage scriptures tonight. Yeah. These are, and hold us a high mileage scripture. You have, a, you have a, a car, I won't say brands because, you know, when an audience is supposed to go forever, Honda's huh? going a long time. Some people are saying, go, 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 go. Well, some scriptures are really valuable because if you don't know exactly right scripture, you can make them apply. Let's look at Isaiah 54, 17, and I didn't give these to you, Don, but I want to throw some in. You ought to have some backup where if you can't think what to pray for somebody, you just throw this one out. Oh, yeah, this is Isaiah 54, 13. Well, both of them are in the same chapter. This is what I say over you guys. All your sons will be taught of the Lord, and the well-being of your sons will be great. I started saying that when Nathan was born over Nathan. 
when Christiana came along every day, and I'd start to be afraid that they'd go to the world, and I'd say, no, my sons are taught of the Lord, and the well-being, the shalom, the well-being of my sons is great. Well, finally, after I'd been pastoring for about six months, it occurred to me that I carry y'all around in my heart the way I do my babies. How many of you have kids and you carry them in your heart all the time? You're never really out of your heart. Well, that's the way you are with me. If you come on a regular basis, you're my kids. So I started saying, when the devil would make you afraid, somebody's going to backslide and say, no, all my sons are taught of the Lord. And great is the well-being of my children. And then look at this. This scripture, this is the one, if you want an all-purpose scripture, he said, wouldn't you like us to know 39,000 verses? Yeah, it's better. It's better to know the exact verse that's tailor made. But when you see somebody under attack, you can stand on this verse. No, read this with me. No, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is for me, declares the Lord. If you go to the verses before to find out what the conditions are, it's somebody serving God. And if I see somebody under attack, like maybe that it could be a person that doesn't love God is showing an interest in them and that's going to draw them away. And you say, that's not an attack. It most certainly is. It's an attack on the call of God in your life. And I would just say, no weapon formed against their destiny is going to prosper. If you're sick and you can't think of the healing scriptures, this will work. That cancer is a weapon formed against them. And he said, what are you trying to say? You can't take on everybody's battles. No, but you can help. You can help to never use your tongue to reinforce what the enemy's doing. Yeah. Ephesians 4.29. Are you still in Ephesians 4? I don't know. Some of you might be. We started out in Ephesians 4. I love this scripture. But I have to give you the literal. You know where it says, no, let no unwholesome word? There's a Bible right there that gives you the literal, you can pick it up afterwards, a footnote, it's marked in pink. You know what that word unwholesome means in the Greek is rotten. No, no rotten word proceed out of your mouth. Now right away we think, well, a rotten word would be cussing, or a rotten word would be anger. Let me tell you something, every unbelief, every word that affirms what the devil's doing is rotten. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. True. Hallelujah. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. How are you going to edify somebody? You tell them what the word says. You tell them, you know, if they're all confused. Confusion is of the devil, all right? Confusion is a weapon to get people immo immobilized to not do anything for God. He said, look, confusion is not going to prosper against you. You're his sheep, and you know his voice. If somebody says, well, that person's got mental issues, I would say, no, I don't believe that. I believe that God subdues confusion in their lives, and that person is the sheep of the Most High God, and Jesus, their shepherd, speaks to them, and they know his voice. You can use your faith to help people. What about the 2 Corinthians 2.14? This is another high mileage scripture. God always... Okay, that's one we're going to go to later. Instead of 5.14, we'll go to 2.14. Sorry, I'm quoting scripture that I don't have down here. I, I like scripture. You know why I like scripture? Scripture will take you from being an abysmal failure to being a success. If you believe it. Read it with me. But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. It manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of Him in every place. Now that's a blind scripture. Your kids, if you're worried about how they're doing a class at school, you say, Lord, I believe that you're going to lead them into success in this test. Now, they, they do their homework, okay? I'm not saying that. But, um, okay. Now right now I can see some of you thinking, I think this is over the board. Can you show all of this from another completely different scripture? Yes. Now we go to 2 Corinthians 5.14 have up there. This, this passage is actually the clearest to see it. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. Well, if it does, what am I going to speak over you when I think of you? Faith or, or curses? You understand, those are the only two. You can say unbelief instead of curses, but unbelief is a curse. Every single time you say, well, I don't think they're going to make it financially. That's a curse. Yeah. It's also unbelief. Okay, so if you don't like this lesson. Can I tell you a secret? You can say, well, I want something for me, not everybody else. This is what I've found. If I'll use my faith for you, everything I need is just there. I don't even have to pray. Well, 
Why? Because God loves God that much. God cares for his people. If your heart will shepherd his people and always encourage your brothers and sisters and never talk about what you know about them, never talk about a sin you know, never talk about a condition that might be embarrassing to them, God will be with promotion. For the love of Christ controls us. That means we always speak faith. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died, and he died for all so that though they who live might no longer live for themselves. Oh my goodness, that means we have to do this. We're not here for ourselves, we're here to serve. So that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. And you say, why do we live for our brothers and sisters? Listen, what did Jesus say to Peter the last time he appeared to him there when he cooked him breakfast? He says, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. He said, take care of my sheep. Three times, three times, ten my lambs. If you want to show your love for God, be good as sheep. Yeah. Now, this is the scripture that shows the whole lesson we're talking about tonight. Therefore, from now on we recognize no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him in this way no longer. We knew him to begin with in the flesh, but now we know that he's the risen King of kings and Lord of glory. All right? And you say, well, I'm not the King of kings and Lord of glory, but no, but do you know that who you are is so far beyond what you look like you are that it is exciting? The best thing you could do is to take, like, are you in 2 Corinthians 5? Mark this chapter and go home tonight and take notes on who you are. Do I know who I am? You know who you are according to the flesh. You have a hot temper. No. <laughs> We're the knowledge operating here. <laughs> no, you know. We all know who we are according to flesh. We all know if we're grumpy when we get up in the morning. But you don't know who you are in the spirit without revelation. Any more than you know who Jesus is without the revelation of the word. If you'll go through this word... It, all the way through it, I mean, you can take notes in this one chapter on who you are. Verse 14, we already said, well, I know the love of Christ controls me. Verse 15, I know I live for him and not for myself. Verse 16, I no longer recognize my brothers and sisters according to the flesh. Ooh, now what does that mean? It means we see people's struggles, but we also see their potential, and we emphasize and authorize God to do the potential. Let's look at what this verse reads in NIV. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. We don't look at them. Look, look, you know that when people come in here with struggles, you know, sometimes it's not pretty, but you don't have any clue in this world what they've been doing. You don't know. And I just found out that God likes it when we cut them slack and let God do his thing. Look at this same verse, same verse in the Amplified. Consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view, the term of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man, yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in the flesh, in terms of the flesh. So here's what we're saying. If I'm going to see you in Christ, I see you. Whole, spirit, soul, and body. Smart, together, blessed, wise, led of the Holy Spirit in pursuing your destiny. Now that's the vision that I have for every person in this church. Now, okay, we have one other. We have, did we read message here? Did I give you the message on that one? No. Uh, I, I think this is this later on. Anyhow, here's where I want to go. One day, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And you know the scripture is Matthew 16, 14. He says, who do people say that I am? People don't know. They look at the flesh. And some of them said Elijah. And some said Jeremiah. Okay, some said John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. There you go. Wrong. Wait a minute. Was this who Jesus was? No. They looked at him and they said, I bet he's risen from the dead. They, they... Guess what? When we try to come to our conclusions through this head, we end up wrong. Okay? So that, look what happens next. He said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, how did Peter come to the right answer? Watch this. Next verse, verse 17. Jesus said, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. 
they, I didn't give you enough scriptures or verses there, did I? Sorry, we need verse 17 too, but you know the verse. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, the son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. New American Standard says by revelation. If you're here tonight and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not because somebody thumped it in your head. It's because some point a preacher was preaching and sharing the word, and by revelation, the binders came off and you knew that he is the, who he says he is. How many of you by revelation know that Jesus is the Christ? The only way you're going to know who your brothers and sisters are is to read about them in this book. They, they are children of the living God with divine destinies to complete. Now, you're not excited, but you should be, because I'm seeing people change. Now, okay, how did Peter come up with the right answer? You're the Christ by revelation. Everybody say by revelation. revelation. Then say this, I need a revelation, I need a revelation. of who my brothers and sisters in Christ are. Because it's easy to see foibles and, you know, rough spots. But when you see where God's taking people, you just love them so much. Now listen, Jesus never affirmed death or any condition that was from the devil. Look at Mark 5, 38. Remember when he was going to Jairus' house? They came to the house of the synagogue official and he saw a commotion of people loudly weeping and wailing. Next verse. And entering in, he said to them, Why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. Now the truth is, or the fact is, the child had died. And you say, oh, he's lying. No, no, listen to this. He knew something they didn't know. Sleep is temporary, death is permanent. He knew it wasn't permanent. He refused. When Lazarus died, he wouldn't, he wouldn't say the child's dead. You know why? Because this was something he wanted to change. If I see something in you, I want to change, or I think God wants to change, I'm not going to affirm it. Yeah. I'm not going to say, oh my goodness, he's a nervous wreck. I'm just not going to say that. I want to say God is restoring his soul. Yeah. He's giving him peace. Jesus did the same thing when Lazarus died. Look at John 11, you know this, but one. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany of the village of Mary and her sister Martha, verse 3. The sister sent word to him, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Well, Jesus knew in his heart that he had died. Look what he says in verse 11. He said, and the, this he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. Now he knows he's dead. Why did he say he's fallen asleep? He doesn't want to reaffirm what Satan's doing. I wish I'd get this across to you. Every time you say something bad about your brothers and sisters that you know you're helping the devil. It may be causing them embarrassment. Now watch what he does. He said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of his sleep. And the disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. They thought he meant literal sleep. Now Jesus had spoken of death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then he said, I'm glad for your sake that I was not there so that you may believe. Well, let's go to him. And then he raised him from the dead. Now, what was he doing? In both of those cases, he was calling those things which be not as though they were. And this is controversial, but the trouble is, if you, are, if you find a word of faith church controversial, you also find God controversial because God is the one who does this. Yes. Genesis 1, everything was black. And without form. He didn't look and say, dark, dark, look how dark it is. No. no. He looked right into the darkness and said, light be. Hallelujah. He said all sorts of wonderful things over you that have come to pass. And it took faith just for him to see you that way and to say it. Look at Romans 4.17. God said he made Abraham the father. He said, I have made you the father of many nations. And the guy didn't have a kid. Was he lying? No, he was speaking it into existence by faith. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you, in the presence of him whom we believe, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. King James says, calls those things which be not as though they were. The new King James says this, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom we believe, God, who gives life to the dead, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, does God do that? That if I see you and I just say, thank God, God is making you stronger and happier and saner every day. You can say that over me, I don't mind. I can use more sanity. I can use more clarity. That's what God does. God speaks.
speaks, looks at a situation and calls it what he wants it to be. Are you following me? Yes. Who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Did I give you the NIV? I think that's next. In hope against hope he believes so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your descendants be. Oh, I know. It's, it's the um, message. Sorry. Let's look at it, the message in this one. This is good. I don't remember what the message says, I just remember it's good. <laughs> we call Abraham Father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Isn't that what we've always read in Scripture? God saying to Abraham, I set you up as father of many peoples. Abraham was first made father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. To raise the dead to life and make a word, and, and with a word, make something out of nothing. You see, when somebody is up here and they need healing, and we say, we call you healed and let the healing, we are calling on God to do what his word says. And my point tonight, and maybe I'm wrong, make a whole evening of it, I don't know. It's good to do it for yourself, but you need to do it for your kids. And you need, we need to do this for each other. Proverbs 12, 18 says, um, yeah, something. There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. Okay, I can give you lots of other examples of this. If you just say, well, you know, they've always had a problem with whatever. That's like using a sword to hurt somebody and to establish the devil's word. There is one that speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. You know, I can't get away from this part about mental stability. I just want you to know many, many people grapple with instability mentally or depression at one time or another in their life. I mean, you're crazy means you're grappling with being sane and stable and have breath underneath you. But this Bible gives as many promises on rock solid sanity and clarity and joy as it does about physical healing. Yeah. And the same Jesus that purchased your way into heaven has purchased your peace of mind. It says in Isaiah 26, that will keep him in perfect peace. Shalom, shalom, it says, whose mind is stayed on thee. There is not one person anywhere that can't have joy in God and absolute deliverance from anything that's ever assailed you. And that's awesome for you. But what I'm asking you tonight is to use your authority on behalf of everybody else too. When you see, when you see somebody struggling, you say, Lord, how do you see this person? And you know, he'll show that person whole and happy and successful and being a blessing. And you start putting your authority in that direction. Does that make sense? That's what I had for tonight. I felt really strongly about it. And I also want to say, I know a lot of us are doing this already. I'm not saying we're not. But it helps me remember. I just look, I was thinking back today. Yeah, I know it's time to pray. But I was thinking back today how many times, how many situations. And they're too private to share, okay? But so many, I know so much about so many people in this church. And you will never know it. <laughs> Glory. Oh. <laughs> so many places where it could have gone one way or the other. It just looked like they were on a fence and they could have fallen off one way or the other. And God and His grace yeah. kept them through. We have it's just been so many blessings. So I just encourage you to know that your faith for your kids will work and your faith for each other will work.